Thank you for joining us for the welfare question and answer session. My name is Christy Jones. I'm the Community Peer Support Manager at Cardiomopathy UK, and I'll be chairing the session today. Um, over the next 45 minutes or so, you'll be able to submit questions for our panel to answer. Um, if you've got a question that you've yet to submit, just click on the Q&A button on the right of your screen, type in your question and press submit. I'll then pick out questions and direct them to our panelists. Um, if you can't see your question, you've already submitted it, don't worry, there's a slight delay that'll be coming through soon. Um, I'd like to introduce our panel. I'm going to get them to embarrass themselves and wave as I read their names out. Uh, first of all, we've got Ali Thompson, who is our head of services at the charity. Uh, we've also got Dr. Ian McPherson. Uh, Ian is a clinical psychologist uh, by professional background. He has had extensive experience of healthcare from holding senior roles in the NHS. Uh, we also have Yvonne Millerick. Yvonne is a heart failure palliative care nurse consultant lecturer. She works in partnership with patients, families and professionals across NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde. Uh, we also have Emma Greenslade. Emma is the paediatric support nurse with Cardiomopathy UK. We've also got Oshan Evans. Oshan has worked for 11 years as a senior caseworker and then welfare benefits specialist for Citizens Advice Bureau, and then the National Royal, Royal National Institute of the Blind. Uh, Oshin is also a support group leader with the charity for North Wales. Uh, last but not least, we also have Bill Bartholomew. Um, Bill has over 10 years experience in the insurance and financial advice industry. Um, I've got a starter question of pre-submitted questions we have for each of you. Um, we'll start with yourself, Ian, if you don't mind. Um, the question we received was, how can I deal with my worsening condition? Uh, it's affecting my mental health. Well, that's an important area that Ali and I were talking about earlier. And I think a lot of people uh, experience additional pressures on their mental health. One of the things that I would certainly encourage is for you to, c to connect with uh, cardiomyopathy UK to, to discuss options. Um, some support can be available from the association, but we also recognise we can signpost people elsewhere uh, when they might need more support. Um, depending what part of the country you're in, uh, or which country you're in, the services are somewhat different. But we will certainly be running a, a piece in the next My Life, uh, which is the, the magazine that we go out, sends out regularly, about uh, psychological therapy services, which are now much more available than they once were. And we, there's some be some links in that. I would also, however, encourage you to talk to your local GP. Um, people are sometimes reluctant to talk to GPs, and we know that people are sometimes reluctant to bring up their own emotional health issues but GPs are much more aware of these things than they once were and they may well be able to signpost you to local services or local support groups but the important thing to hold on to is mental health issues affect all of us I've been affected by mental health issues throughout my life uh, before long before I knew I had cardiomyopathy and I think it's important that we accept that this is one of the things that will vary just like we have good and bad days with our health our physical health condition we can have good and bad days with our mental health it's a common thing we need support we can get support so talk to a gp talk to our colleagues um, at, at uh, cardiomyopathy uk and there is support out there and we can the organization can try and direct you in the right way so Best of Thanks up. very much for that, Ian. Um, Yvonne, a question for you, if you don't mind. Um, what are the criteria to be put forward for testing to see if you need a heart transplant? And what are the criteria for being put forward to be on the list um, for a heart transplant? So essentially, I think the two, two same questions, really. What are the criteria uh, to be put forward for a heart transplant? OK, so I think... This is something that we need to be discussed on an individual basis for um, with the, the, your clinician um, and bear in mind that there are lots of different advanced therapies that could perhaps be considered prior to cardiac transplantation first. Um, so I wouldn't be able to answer that um, 
on, on a, um, a generalist basis because I think this is about individualised assessment and making sure that the evidence-based therapies that are currently available for you have been explored in, in the first instance. And then if it's found that actually there is um, no further improvement in your clinical um, outcome, then that's a conversation that you then have between yourself, your clinicians and your, your family to explore, first of all, do you meet the, the criteria and is it something that um, would be considered for you going forward? Thanks very much, Yvonne. Um, Emma, an interesting one for you. Uh, are you aware of any studies that indicate a potential correlation between first-person shooter video games and dilated cardiomyopathy in boys in their teenage years and or early 20s? Wow. Wow. Um, I'm just, I'm going to say straight away, I've not heard of a study with any of those linked. So that's really interesting. I'd, I'd be interested to see where you've heard of that yourself. Um, but I've certainly not heard of any studies about video, you know, violent video games in correlation with any sort of cardiomyopathies. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, if anyone else knows any different, but I've not heard of anything um, you know, and we're quite um, aware of any studies that are happening within the UK major trials. So that's not something that I've, I've heard of. But yeah, I'd be interested to hear your, your, your views on that. So perhaps you could email me on a separate occasion. That'd be great. Yeah, whoever asked that question can email Emma at support nurse at cardiomyopathy.org. And that goes through to all of our nurses. Thanks, Emma. Um, Oshin, uh, the question for yourself is, are people with HCM classified as disabled? If so, what support is out there for us and our families? Okay, um, a diagnosis um, of anything doesn't um, automatically class you as disabled. Um, under the Equality Act 2010, a disability is a physical or mental impairment um, with a long, which is sub substantial enough to have a long term effect on your normal day-to-day -day activities so if the hcm ha is very symptomatic and it affects someone's day-to-day -day, um, ability to carry out normal activities they would then be classed in the act um protected in the equality act as being disabled um it's the same with any financial help such as benefits um, personal independence payments, for instance, is a means tested. Um, you can't get it based on a diagnosis per se either. It's based on how you can manage and you receive scored, assess for scores based on your ability to manage the activities or your mobility. So um, if you're HCM is very symptomatic um, and you, then you meet the criteria of the Equality Act and welfare benefit, you would be classed as disabled and also receive financial help. Families can then, if someone's in receipt of something such as PIP or attendance allowance based on their symptoms and ability, can then claim carer's allowance, which then can lead to premiums on other benefits which are um, usually means tested thanks for that ocean yeah. um, um we've got one for what we've got one for bill um the question is bill well it's a bit of a two-part question um can people with cardiomyopathy still get life insurance and also someone's son has been identified as a gene carrier a uh, gene carrier for hcm uh should he get life insurance while he is young and has no other symptoms or will he be penalised for doing this? Uh, yeah, OK. Well, obviously, it's, a, a, as you say, a, a two-pronged question there. Um, in respect of the son who has... Um, did you say that he's had the gene test or he's due to have a gene test? So he's uh, been identified as a gene, car a gene carrier for HCM. Okay. OK. Well, when it comes to life insurance applications, there is... Um, no requirement for the applicant to actually confirm about any form of gene testing that they've had done 
unless the gene test itself was in respect of Huntington's disease, or if the life insurance they're looking for is greater than half a million pounds. Um, so unless it's going to be more than half a million pounds, he's not going to need to disclose the fact that he's had a positive gene test. He will, however, have to disclose the fact that there's a family history of cardiomyopathy. Um, that is almost certainly going to lead to uh, a request from the insurance company to his GP for some medical records um, if he has got no actual physical signs or symptoms of cardiomyopathy himself, that he does have the faulty gene, um, then I would certainly be able to get some life insurance for that particular individual. Um, but it, there would be a small rating applied to it because of the family history of cardiomyopathy. Obviously, somebody with a family history of cardiomyopathy, even though they've got no signs or symptoms themselves, could potentially go on to, um, to, 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 to be diagnosed with the condition. So the insurance companies will factor that in and say, well, this person, because of the family history, is a higher risk to us for life insurance than somebody with no family history of cardiomyopathy. So there would be a small element of, of loading for it. Where it becomes more difficult is when there's a confirmed diagnosis for that individual. And that's when it becomes more and more specialized then. And um, what was the first part of the question? Sorry, Christine. Yeah, the first part of the question was a, a more of a general question, which was, can people with cardiomyopathy still get life insurance? Yes, okay, so I've, I've partly covered off uh, the answer to that with the answer to the second part. Um, there are a number of factors to that. Um, the first one I would always say is age at diagnosis, how they've been recently, um, in, for instance, the last 12 months, have they been able to demonstrate some stability in their condition? It's not deteriorated. Um, the type of cardiomyopathy. Um, there are lots of different variables, which is why, obviously, uh, it's, it's very much on a case-by-case -case basis when I talk to my clients, how I can help them. But, yes, um, bottom line, can definitely get it. It just depends on their medical history. Great. Thank you, Bill. Um, I'll open this uh, next one up to the up to the panel, and if you if you'd like to step forward and answer it, uh, please go ahead. Um, we've had a couple of questions relating to parents of children with cardiomyopathy regards benefits. So the general question is: Are parents of children with cardiomyopathy entitled to any benefits? Um, Shall I up one? Yeah. Um, uh, they, if the child is eligible for disability living based on their um, ability to carry out, oh, well, the, based on the um, additional care needs they may have or mobility, if they meet the middle rate care the child does of disability living allowance, the parents can then claim carer's allowance. That depends if they're if they um, offer additional care 35 hours a week, um, do not work and earn more than £120 um, and not in education themselves, the parents aren't in full-time education. One, so of the, um, one, of, one of the specific um, examples that were given in one of the questions is, I've been looking after my child during lockdown um, am I entitled to any out of work benefits while I've been caring for my child? I have a zero hours contract as a delivery driver. Um, if he's self employed, I've looked into you know entitlements during COVID. Um, they're self employed income support, which is a grant that covers earnings up to three months. Um, March and it was reintroduced afterwards. Um, so there's the self-employed um, income support. Um, the Cardiomyopathy UK helpline would be able to access information specific to someone. Um, there's universal credit after rate after COVID. Um, yeah, and there's are um, also people on working tax credit. Um, or universal credit in specific area if they've um, been contacted by track and trace or through uh, or be tested positive uh, they get an additional 13 pounds a day um, 
that's that's because if someone's out of work as well, universal credit they've got child responsibility because of COVID, um, that is also into consideration with their claimant commitments to find work, um, you know, that would be made. Um, so it's less likely that someone would be sanctioned if they can't, you know, look or find work. Just on the on the back of that, thanks, Osh. Just on the back of that, I, I don't know how much of that came through because it was a little bit crackly my end. Oh, um, yeah. No, that's okay. Um, so just just uh, just to add on to to what Oshan had said there, if you have any concerns or that person or people in a, a similar situation, do ring the helpline uh, anytime Monday to Friday between eight thirty and four thirty. Ask for me. Ali specifically, and then we can look at it at a case by case and assess uh, what you might be entitled to and what your next steps are to, to try and get that um, that benefit, if that's a help. Thanks, Oshin and Ali, for that one. Um, next question might be uh, probably ad addressed to Ali, Emma and Ian, I would imagine. Um, in what ways can Cardiomyopathy UK help my wife and kids? I have the condition, but sometimes I feel they worry about it more than me. Okay, I'll, I'll, shall I lead on that one? Just going on that one. Um, so one of the things that that uh, is embedded in in all of our support services is that it's not just the person who's been diagnosed is the person that we support. So we do support wider family networks. Um, we have a specific group, Facebook closed group for carers and supporters of someone with the condition. We also, depending on how old your, your children are, young people are, we have a, a closed Facebook group for 14 to 25 year olds. We also obviously have our paediatric nurse there who can provide any information uh, to children, young people who might be worried about, about you. Um, we also have specific uh, resources that are available to download from our website that are written for parents, um, for supporters uh, and carers. And we also have our telephone peer support volunteers who uh, a number of whom are carers and who do have children with a person who has the, the diagnosis. So a similar situation to yourself. So you are more than welcome to, to contact uh, me or via the, the, the website directly. And we can get some support in whatever way your partner and your children want to receive that support, whether it's a one-to-one -one call, whether it's a closed Facebook group, whether it's talking to another young person. Um, so whatever's best for, for them, we can, we can certainly provide. Yeah, going off the back of that as well, I speak with lots of, um, you know, husbands, wives, parents of, you know, children or, you know, siblings um, all the time. So, you know, don't hesitate getting in touch um so you know it can be invaluable just to talk things through with somebody that understands people sometimes find it um frustrating and difficult to talk to family and friends because they haven't got a full grasp of the condition so you know it really does you know take a weight off your shoulders just to speak with someone that you know does have that understanding of the condition and and can support you so you know whoever it was that asked that don't hesitate to get in contact don't think i've got a lot to add to, to that because the, the, the very good advice. But one thing is to say that families very often do have difficulties. Families worry about the person with the condition. We know that from surveys we've done and it's not always easy for families to discuss. So again, to accept this as normal. You've heard from Emma and Ali that there is support available specific and that that can be tailored to what will meet uh, your family's needs best. Thanks very much, everyone. Um, next one, I'll open out to um, whoever would like to answer it. Uh, this could be from a healthcare professional, this one actually is. Without face-to-face -face appointments, uh, it is harder to build relationships between healthcare professionals and patients. Uh, is there anything we can do about this? Is this coming from a healthcare professional themselves or um, it sounds I'm not I'm not sure, lovely. but that was that was what the context that I took from it. Yeah, I mean it's hard, isn't it? I, I don't know. Lots of clinics are doing Zoom um, consultations. I don't know about Yvonne, what your experience is. I know that lots speaking with lots of people, they're doing lots of Zoom consultations and you can get a little bit of um, uh, warmth and you know discussion through that kind of um, 
aspect and yeah it can be really difficult when you're used to having those kind of set times with your consultant and your nurse specialist and your wider team so it can be it's you know it's been a difficult time for everybody so I think it's about you know perhaps reaching out to your consultants or your team your nurse specialists and 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 seeing what other services that they you know that they're offering in terms of you know the consultations because you might be able to you know extend it out if you're only just having a phone consultation and you might prefer to have a more face-to-face consultation you might be able to ask if they can do that kind of um zoom or any other kind of online um face-to-face contacts and then I think soon the clinics should be, you know, the cl- clinics are up and running now. So there might be a backlog. So just wait and see where you are in terms of being able to get that face to face contact. But if you're just trying to reach out and you want to get some more support, you know, you can always, you know, speak with um, us as well, because we can help you with, you know, navigating through the, the NHS and also speaking with, you know, getting in touch with other various healthcare professionals that, you know, you might um, benefit from speaking with and also just getting in touch with other people that are in the same position as you, because that can really help just talking it through. Yeah, I, I would just add to that by saying that um, many services across the UK are often a suite of consultations and um, which includes telephone um, consultations or virtual consultation. But if neither of those meet your needs, then please say to your clinician that that doesn't meet your needs and that there are other consultations that are on offer. Um, And it may include a a face-to-face consultation at a clinic or it might be that they're often a mobile um, clinic um, solution where they're able to you're able to, to attend yeah. your local GP surgery and yeah. um, see your clinician there. Yeah. So that yeah. there is innovative ways of um, reaching out um, to to your clinicians. But if in the absence of them knowing that the telephone consultation is not meeting your needs then they're most likely to continue um, with, with that method. One of the other things to, to, that we all need to adjust to, and, and I think that all those of us who work in the NHS are, are, are getting used to this, is that where, where we do go back to face-to-face, there will almost certainly be uh, people will be wearing uh, PPE, personal protection equipment, and... Uh, that in itself raises quite a few issues mm. too. Um, yeah. But but I think the important bit, and I really echo what Emma and Yvonne have said, is is to actually just say. Um, and and if you don't feel confident about that, then Emma and her colleagues would be able to advise you on ways of approaching this. But it's new for everybody. It's new for NHS staff. Uh, new for all of us. And I think it, unless we actually share with each other the experience, uh, we're not going to get it right. And if you're doing it, you may be doing it for yourself, but you're actually doing it will help other people who don't find it so easy to ask questions. So strongly encourage you to follow through on that. Definitely, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, guys. Following on from um, Ian's last uh, comment there, actually, is a question for Ali. Um, The question is, I would like to share my experience and support with other folks living with cardiomyopathy. Is this something I could help the charity with? And if so, how do I do this? Absolutely. Um, We have a number of different opportunities for volunteering uh, through the charity. So we have a a telephone peer support volunteers who provide support as one might expect over the telephone. We have our support group leaders and our in-clinic volunteers. We also have our children, young people's youth panel. So if you're aged between 14 and 25 and you'd like to be part of, uh, it's kind of like a mini board of, of children, young people shaping services, then that's another opportunity and also our brand new uh, change makers um, volunteering project which has uh just is just coming out at the moment um so there's a a variety of ways that you can share your 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 kind of your experience and definitely your support we have our um community peer support training course online training course is being released the end of october so i would encourage you to either contact the lead manager who is christy the gentleman asking the questions or myself 
Um, you can find our email address on the on the website and do get involved because uh, it, it, it's just wonderful to be able to get more volunteers involved. And I think it, it's really good for people to volunteer because you'll get so much out of the course. You'll learn about um, basic counselling skills. You'll, you'll be able to use your own kind of skills and, and look at how you deal with issues and, and how that can be um, a help to other people. Uh, so please do get in touch with, with Christy Jones or myself and we would uh, be absolutely delighted to have you on board and also my colleague Natalia who runs the Changemakers um, programme which is also advertised on the website. So do take a look and, and come forward. Thank you very much, Ali. Um, the next one is, can antidepressants and anxiety medication make DCM and arrhythmia worse? I mean, absolutely. There's um, certain medications, certain um, SSRIs and certain other anti-anxiety medications so um, that, you know, don't work if you've got a cardiomyopathy or a particular um, rhythm disturbances. So you really do need to have, um, you know, a good discussion with your GP if they're the ones that are wanting to, uh, to prescribe the um, uh, antidepressants or anti-anxiety. So you need to have a chat with them because they will be able to give you the right drug. So you, they need to know your full history um, and they'll give you the right drug because there are drugs that you can take for anxiety and depression, but it needs to be the right one so that it doesn't um, co contraindicate with your medications that you're taking for your cardiomyopathies. Or, um, Dr. McPherson, he, um, you know, speaks with lots of patients, you know, um, with, with cardiomyopathies that, you know, are needing to have additional support for depression and anxiety. Um, it's not uncommon. So there's, there's drugs there that, you know, that you can take. So, um, yeah, make sure you chat with your cardiologist and GP firstly about that. Great. Thanks, Emma. Um, the next one is I have bipolar 2 as well as cardiomyopathy. I get lots of help clinically with my heart, but not much for my mental health. Why is this and what can I do to change this? Well, I, I'll quickly come in on that. I mean, that's uh, it's, it's rather interesting to hear that because normally it's the other way around. That pe because people with uh, significant mental health conditions such as bipolar very often don't get their uh, physical health attended to as well as people who don't have these conditions. It's like the mental health condition overshadows the uh, physical health condition. But the important thing for you is to be able to request help for it. Um, bipolar can, is a condition that can be very well treated and contained and many people live with it. But if you feel you need more support, the first point of contact would be your GP. Um, I presume you will be seeing your GP reasonably regularly because you will need to be having your medication uh, reviewed. Um, there are services and uh, the, sometimes what happens is if somebody doesn't seem to be having problems, the services are withdrawn so that they're offered to people who appear to have more needs. But if you've got needs, please use that to go talk to your GP. And uh, depending on what area you're, you're in, you can ac sometimes access support uh, without going to your GP. But given the complexity of having uh, uh, cardiomyopathy and bipolar, I think it would be very good to go and get your GP's advice and ask, are the community mental health services locally, either provided by the NHS or indeed there are some fantastic services provided by voluntary sector organisations, which uh, I work in mental health still, and we work very closely with voluntary sector organisations in our area. So there is help there. Um, I know you read in the paper that it's very difficult to get. Well, actually, if, if you do want it and your GP understands it, it is possible to do. And a lot of the voluntary organisations, you don't need to go through your GP. So if you looked at your local voluntary or voluntary sector organisations, the different ones in different areas, but they are there. And I would strongly encourage you to seek help. Um, if you don't get support from your GP, then maybe just go direct to some of the voluntary sector organisations in the first instance, because they should be able to help you. If you do need more specialist help from the NHS, get that. 
Thanks for that, Ian. Um, the next one is for yourself, Yvonne. Um, how long can someone with DCM continue on heart failure and cardiac medication before drugs stop working? So that's a really difficult question to answer, but it, but it is an interesting one. I think um, the, the medication that's evidence-based will continue to work as effectively um, as it is as it as it has done from from the the beginning, I think there is um, concern around the use of diuretics because people can develop a resistance to um, diuretics and um, may require adjustment of the diuretic doses, but also may have to stop a diuretic that they were previously on for years and change over to um, another one in order to get the, the, the same effect from it. Um, and we do call this the resistant cycle of, of diuretics. With regards to um, the other evidence-based drugs, then there's no reason why. Um, these are um, lifelong medications um, and provided um, you're being monitored and there's no reason why um, you shouldn't be able to, to keep continuing with them. The exception to that is clearly if through the monitoring process they discover that um, your kidneys are perhaps not um, as working as well as, as they should, then they may require to adjust your um, ACE inhibitors or your um, MRAs um, in response to that. But again, that's a very difficult question to answer because it's down to individual responses and there isn't a textbook answer. And that's where it's really important to have a good relationship with your heart failure clinician so that they can continue to monitor you closely and make sure that the desired effects from the evidence-based treatments are continuing and that the less desired effects are kept to the minimum. Thank you very much for that, Yvonne. Um, the next question is, I have been rejected for personal independence payment, so PIP, or getting a blue badge because of my age, uh, despite having severe DCM and symptoms such as breathlessness, struggling to walk long distances or upstairs or inclines. How do I go about getting the support I need? Uh, I'm told because I'm only 24, I'm not eligible for this. Um, again, um, they shouldn't refuse personal independence payments based on someone's age. Um, what they've done is is um, scored inf insufficiently on the mobility or daily living activities. The assessor hasn't given enough points to meet the criteria for either the daily living element of PIP or um, the mobility. So therefore, what they need to do is lodge a mandatory reconsideration um, either by phone or um, or by letter. Um, I believe that Cardiomyopathy UK helpline support people with that. Asking them to look at um, the decision again, get um, evidence from the cardiologist. Usually what helps is the last or most recent um, attendance letter reports from the last consultation if that confirms limited mobility or symptoms and everything put that in context of the criteria for PIP and then persuade the DWP to change the decision um, and score additional points need to do that within a month um, exceptions have been do done because of COVID for, for late mandatory reconsiderations if that doesn't work then there's the tribunal um, process so the person can appeal the decision if they do not agree with it um, so they need to go through the PIP activities see what points they think that they should score get evidence to demonstrate that they do meet those criteria, and ask the DWP to look at the decision again just going to go on the back of that. So one of the things that we do at the charity um, is that we help people challenge uh, a first 
tier, what they call a first tier appeal, which Osha mentioned was ma uh, mandatory reconsideration, where you, where the DWP have to look again at your claim. The second one is tribunal, which we attended one of those over the phone last week, the week before. One of the problems is with PIP is that people don't complete the forms as perhaps they should. So they're not exactly clear. So they might say, oh, I, I'm, I'm, you know, can you get out of bed and get, get on with, yes, I'm fine. People forget that sometimes they forget to put that they're breathless upon waking or that when they've woken up, they don't feel rested. They sometimes forget get to, to, to say when I you know I wear slip on shoes as opposed to tie up shoes because I can't bend because of the extra pressure on my heart so what we suggest is that you contact us on the helpline so that we can actually help you to think about what your a, a, a day in the life of a day in your life is like because you have to remember that DWP assessors they're not automatic they don't automatically have cardiac knowledge it's knowledge so some of them might be disability analysts some of them might be uh, mental health nurses some people might might be paramedics it, you're assuming that they have a, a a knowledge of cardiomyopathy which they might not have so we help you to frame that application the best way you can to accurately depict your your life and then if you are rejected then we help you to appeal. So I would I would just give us a bell um, next week and let's see if we can help you and look at your circumstances and how we can best portray your life to the, the assessor. Thanks guys. Um, we're gonna take one more question. Um, I'm going to, just to let you know as well, any unanswered questions will be, answers to those will be posted on our website next week, along with videos from today's presentations. So next week, just head along to cardiomyopathy.org and there'll be clear instructions of where to go uh, to find all the questions that were submitted but not answered today. Uh, the final question is for yourself, Bill. Um, it has been widely publicized that underlying health conditions can have an effect on people who contract COVID-19. How do you see this affecting insurance premiums and policies moving forward? For example, travel insurance, mortgages, et cetera, for people with underlying conditions such as cardiomyopathy? Uh, yes, yeah, very good question, actually. And it's, uh, it's especially prominent in the last two or three that like insurance needs. Basically, the insurance company, because there's no hard and fast proven data that they can access and therefore quantify the additional risk that the applicant poses to them in, in respect of life insurance. Um, anybody that's at the moderate to severe end of the cardiomyopathy spectrum, they're just completely uh, almost a blanket a ban at the moment in respect of trying to offer terms for them or even considering an application from people. So if you're in um, at the lower end of the cardiomyopathy spectrum, then there's still a chance that you can get, get cover offered. The moment, as I say, it starts to venture into the moderate or severe affected category. And um, for instance, anybody with an ICD, whilst they, like myself with my ICD, you know, we're, we're leading very uh, healthy, fit lives. But because we've got an ICD, that in the insurance company industries uh, view means we're higher risk. And then because of the impact of COVID, they're saying, no, we don't really understand what would happen to this person if they contracted COVID. Therefore, it makes the risk uncalculable at the moment. So we're not going to consider that classification of people. It's certainly not for the next six months. And I dare say um, this is the last three months now I've encountered this, it'll probably be a further postponement after that period as well. They just really need to get some hard and fast data on the impact of COVID on people with uh, with any form of cardiomyopathy. So as I say, if you've got moderate to severe cardiomyopathy at the moment, the chances of getting life insurance are virtually non-existent. But I'm hopeful that that will change very soon. Uh, Thanks, I hope, Bill. Yeah, I hope that's answered. Excellent. Thank you, Bill. Um, to sign off here, but I'm just going to say thank you very much again to our panel, Ian, Bill, Ali, Yvonne, Emma and Oshin. Um, thanks to everyone who submitted questions. And in five minutes time, we'll be having our closing remarks from our chair of trustees, Alison Fielding. So we will see you there.